Hello, everybody. Welcome to the virtual plant clinic. Um, Dr. Lester is not able to be with us today. He is in a meeting. Um, I believe he's helping teach master gardeners. So it's just me. I'm Lily Browning um, with my special guests. Um, I am Bill's regular co-host, as he likes to call me. So, you know, as we say, Ed McMahon is in charge of today's <laughs> Tonight Show. Um, and I have some special guests. See, Bill always promises guests, you know, and then he doesn't get to it. See, I deliver, <laughs> I deliver the guests. Um, we have Hannah Brinkley, and she is the director at the Chinsigat Conservation Center here in Hernando County. And Hannah brought a coworker. So, Hannah, if you could introduce yourself and your coworker as well, and we'll find out where you're from and, and what you do. So, so good morning, everyone. everyone. I, I'm Hannah Brinkley, like Lily said. Um, I'm, I'm the director of the Chiefs and Conservation Center, Center, and we provide all, all kinds of programs, programs to the public, like everything from archery, to uh, special topics like we're having uh, Sherry Clark, Clark from the Bat Conservancy for International Bat Night at the end of August. So we're super excited about all of that. Uh, today I brought right with me our educator specialist, Casey Flynn. She's on my left. I think you're echoing. I don't know if anybody. Is that me? It might be because you're both have your mics on in the same room. Sometimes. Here, I can mute my mic. Yeah, see, now you're not echoing. Well, hello, Casey. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> and uh, you are the education specialist. So yes, ma'am. You're, you're, you're new at your job there at Shinsuke, correct? Yes, I just started on May 20th. Okay. All right. So, um, and good morning, Monique. I see you <laughs> there. Um, Hannah. So what is, first of all, some people may not even know what we're saying when we're saying Chinsigat mm -hmm. <laughs> Conservation Center. Um, they may have heard of the Chinsigat Hill Manor House. So what is the difference? Why do you have the same odd name? <laughs> Where did the name come from? Could you tell us a little bit of the history? Sure. So originally, Oh, am I still oh, echoing back? I'm great now. Okay, good. Um, so originally, we are called, or we share the same namesake, the Chinsika Hill Manor House and the Conservation Center, because originally we were uh, owned by the same person. Uh, this land, there was once 2,000 acres in this area that was owned by Colonel Raymond Robbins, and he was a world traveler. And after one of his trips to Alaska, he was inspired by the native Inuit language to prescribe this area the name Chinsigit. Um, to him, he got the inspiration as up, up there. He, he understood it to mean the place where things of true value that have been lost may be found again. Um, that's what he believed the word Chinsigit meant according to that language. And so that's where we get our name. And so eventually the properties have split. The manor house is now run by the Tampa Bay uh, History Society and the Retreat and Conference Center, I believe by the county right now. But across the street from them uh, at the Chitsigat Conservation Center, uh, we are run by the state of Florida, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, and they own, it's called Chitsigat Wildlife Environmental Area. We're nestled within that. And so we function, which then this this beautiful um, state lands where there's um, there's not hunting on these state lands. It's just primary purpose is for other types of recreation. People can hike our trails. People, a lot of folks like to bird, to, to come out here for photography. And of course, come to the conservation center for the various programs that we provide. So that's, that's a little bit about us. Mm -hmm. And I have um, been in partnership as well as Dr. Mm -hmm. Lester. Um, has been in partnership over the years. I love to go up there, you know, any any time I can have a class up there. It's just such a beautiful ride. It's such a beautiful area. It is in Lake Lindsay, which is it's actually on Lake Lindsay Road, which is um, North Brooksville. 
Um, and it is just, I mean, I'm often envious that you get to work in such <laughs> a beautiful um, setting. And you're right. Um, you, yeah, Audubon meets there, correct? And They do. Uh, when Hernando Audubon uh, are in season, they're, they're usually meet between September and April. They have monthly beginning birding walks out here, usually on the last Friday of the month. In the morning, they meet at the conservation center and they're here for about three hours. They they start um, birding at the bird feeders just behind the conservation center and, and take oh, a yes. walk. And, and over the years, you guys have, um, well, even before you got there, um, started doing some uh, fix ups and everything. Well, you, you utilized the time of lockdown to, you know, really work on um, fixing up the area, you know, so. Did. Uh, yeah, I maybe. remember before you had that back deck or any doors to get back to it. So that back deck mm -hmm. with the, the doors going back there really is a big, huge boost, I think, to your area to go out there and watch the birds. And it's, it's really exciting this year. It's, it's on our plan to put a ramp, a wheelchair accessible ramp to that back deck. Oh. So that, so that folks can access it even when the doors to the center are closed, like our official hours are Friday and Saturday, eight to two. So we're hoping to put a ramp so that folks can um, access that at any time. So your hours are Friday and Saturday, eight to two. Mm -hmm. So does that mean we can only go there during that time or the public? can go there during that time or can you get on the property otherwise? So you can get on the property and use our trails anytime during the day. So it, the conservation center is only officially mm -hmm. open Fridays and Saturdays eight to two, but folks can access the same tract of land from our Southern entrance, which is at the corner of Snow Memorial Highway in 41. And it, the whole nature center loop trail is about two miles. And so it, it'd be about a little over a mile if you wanted to walk from that southern entrance to where the center is and, and the restrooms and go around. We have the uh, Maze Prairie is the central feature. So just the whole loop is two miles. Um, and it's, it's just a nice walk. So that little peninsula where Snow Memorial and 41 meet, and mm -hmm. there's, there was a, like, a pavilion or something there. But, so, yeah. Yeah, we so have an official welcome later. sign there in a kiosk. And a okay. bench. So um, you could park there and take that beautiful mm -hmm. walk that you're talking about. Or if they wanted to drive up to your center, you would either stay on 41 and turn left on Lake Lindsay yep. Road, mm -hmm. or you would go on Snow Memorial and turn right on Lake Lindsay mm -hmm. Road. Just remember, a big portion of that Snow Memorial is 35 miles per hour. <laughs> Do not get <laughs> caught doing otherwise. <laughs> um, so Casey, you say you're an education specialist. What kind of programs do you have coming up there? So actually tomorrow we are starting a brand new program. Uh, we're gonna be doing what we call our knee high naturalist program. Uh, it's geared more towards preschool age children. Mm -hmm. um, and then Saturday we're actually doing the beginner archery. Uh, and we're doing two sessions of that. It's super popular. Um, and then next, next week, week, I think I was talking about, about we have, have the uh, bat, bat program bat. With, with Sherry Clark. Clark. Okay. Uh, yes. Unfortunately, you're echoing too. So what she <laughs> talked about was the knee high naturalist program, which is for preschoolers, and that sounds very exciting to me. You know, you really got to get them, get them going early and young when they're really excited about seeing bugs and <laughs> seeing nature and all that. And archery on Saturday, you said, which I hope yes. is not the preschoolers. And no. <laughs> okay. And um, you mentioned a bat program. Mm -hmm. uh, it's for International Bat Nights, which is uh, officially going to be the 27th and 28th of August. Uh, but we're going to do our program on the night of the 27th. Um, just have some people come out, do some crafts and uh, listen to Sherry Clark for about an hour and then um, watch the bats leave the bat house, nice. um, which oh, is, it's, yeah. it's a great experience. It's, yeah. there's not really anything like it. And 
the next month we start our homeschool programs mm-hmm. um, and we have various age ranges for that also. Right. It, I know that your, pro, your, your center is a, um, you know, really great benefit for homeschool kids because if they can go there, first of all, the kids can run around and be <laughs> you know, free out in the woods, but um, they, they can learn a whole lot. Now, um, oh, I, I just have to mention this. Gina said I would mention it every time I saw her. I don't know. <laughs> but you mentioned the bad houses. One of those bad houses was my nephew's evil project. I just have, <laughs> I have to <laughs> always bring that up. He's um, like 31 now, but <laughs> so it, it may even be that his has been uh, remodeled or replaced. I'm not sure, but that was very important to him to, to help with that. Um, so I lost what I was going to ask you. <laughs> How long have you been... The director there, Hannah. Has this been about a year now? So I started in February of 2021. So it's been about a year and a half. Okay. It's just you long enough to figure out. Stuff right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just to start to figure out what I'm doing. I, I've lived in the area since 2018. So I'm not entirely new to this area, but um, but new to the center and honestly new to focusing on education and outreach. It had always been a component to what I did, but I primarily did land management and uh, worked with animals and did biologist work primarily before this. So this is, it's been a change, but it's been um, amazing. I, I love working with people. Um, well, we're speaking about uh, land management. Before we went uh, on air, Hannah and I were talking about, um, I guess it's about the time of the year because you're running a campaign um, regarding the palmetto berries. And um, that is major food for our Florida black bear. Um, Do the gopher tortoises eat them, I believe, as well? Gopher tortoises will eat anything low enough to the ground for them to (laughs) reach. That's definitely possible. But there's there's been an issue for, you know, many, many, many years of people collecting them so that they can, because there's a market, you know, a human market for them. So would you like to talk about that a little bit about, I mean, the problems, the issues and why we shouldn't, you know, why we should leave them for the animals and all of that. Sure. So I I, I don't feel like I'm an expert in the subject, but I shouldn't say that about myself, but um, (laughs) we'll go with this. Um, I do know that it's a, like you're saying, it's a really important food source for not just bears, but a lot of different animals. And, um, And our animals need that natural food source. And one of the reasons they need it, not just for their health and benefit, but for our health and benefit. When we take away a wild food source from animals, that increases the likelihood that we're gonna have negative interactions with them, that they're gonna be searching out and looking for food in our trash when they don't have enough to eat. And so really it's important to leave um, palmetto berries for the animals, especially on state lands and places where it's illegal to collect them. Um, And I understand some folks collect a a minimal amount for personal use in places where it's legal to do so, whether they've gotten uh, permission from a private landowner or um, I think believe it's you know, it's legal on right of ways and other places like that. But um, but it's just important to maintain that balance and to not over harvest uh, those palmetto right. berries. Because there is a market. I mean, people, and they're out there picking and they give it to whoever who gives it to whoever. But, you know, there's, I guess, medicinal right. markets. And, sure. and, you know, it has uh, for men's health and other various, mm-hmm. um, so they say. But, you know, especially right. on the state lands and everything, yeah, don't take the food away from from the bears or any of those other critters. And the other, how I look at it uh, from the Florida-friendly landscaping standpoint and from where I live, I don't live very far from you. I live off of Hexham. Mm. Uh, I don't kind of live in that same northwestern area of the county um, um, <clears throat> that... People that we watch on the, you know, the Royal Highlands Facebook groups, 
who can come in and get rid of all my palmetto bushes? I, you know, it's like the first thing people want to do is get rid of all the palmetto bushes. And this is one of those things where um, there's, you know, I'm usually dealing with people new to Florida and, you know, who may not be aware, but then I have this other group of native <laughs> Floridians who grew up with all kinds of myths. <laughs> and of sure. course, one of the biggest ones is that palmetto bushes attract rattlesnakes. I mean, what, 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 you, you know, of course they attract snakes. Any kind of bushes would attract snakes. Are there, is, are they, you know, a particular attractant to rattlesnakes or is it just a home? You're, you're right. That is a homegrown myth. Um, any structure that provides cover is an attractant to a wild animal in a landscape where, especially some of these home landscapes that are kept barren, like mowed grass. Uh, and you might have a one bush. Well, lots of things are going to be attracted to that because uh, animals need cover uh, to feel protected. So, the, but there's no special relationship between palmettos and snakes. Um, they're not a particular attractant. You're not definitely going to have rattlesnakes if you have palmetto bushes. You're going to have, if you have palmetto bushes and you keep them, you're going to attract a variety of wildlife that you're probably really going to enjoy. I have them, and I mean, we have gotten rid of some closer to the house because um, we have these tiny, tiny little doglets <laughs> that are in a yeah. fenced area. And, you know, I don't want hiding places close there for coyotes or things like that. But mm -hmm. um, we now have an acre because we bought the lot next door. So, oh, yeah, believe me, the palmetto bushes, they're already there. Nature put them there. They are like a city of birds and other rabbits and other wildlife. This is Corey here. Don't worry about what he's saying. He's yeah. a regular and he is being sarcastic. <laughs> so he just, That's what I thought. <laughs> he's he's um, just moved to Florida. He hasn't. He's pretending to be somebody. Can someone come here and get rid of all the Florida stuff in my yard? Absolutely, Corey. That seems to be what we hear. And yeah, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, it's there for a reason. Great stuff. So when they're listening from Facebook, we don't get to see their name. Um, so Facebook user, whoever you are, they want to know about getting rid of aphids. I'm not sure on what plant you're referring to. Um, I know, you know, many plants attract aphids. Um, what I would do, Dr. Lester knows my very best um, my favorite thing to do involves, of course, scouting. And if there's a problem area, snip, throw away, it's gone. <laughs> I've not used a single, you know, chemical. Um, also, a good stream of water, you know, a good heavy stream of water um, will get rid if you have some aphids, as well as your beneficials. I've been telling a story <laughs> over the weeks of, um, my front pollinator bed in front of my house. I happen to have put a lot of salvia in it. And apparently I found out this year that really attracts mealybugs. So I have yet to use a single chemical. I cut off, some of it I cut off pretty severely, but you know, I didn't pull them out. So they're growing back to get rid of those mealybugs, um, put them in a plastic bag. <laughs> And it's just throw them away. Saw a couple ladybugs. I'm like, oh, I'm going to put you back out. And if I can make it work, I'm going to show you a picture of something that was also of benefit to me. So that's what I would do as well as if you're going to have to use some kind of chemical, um, you know, the horticultural soap and oils you will usually, if it's a really bad infestation, will smother, smother those aphids. Boris, um, oh, we just had you. So there's somebody listening in here, uh, you know. <laughs> he's multitasking <laughs> here, and this is what he always says, too. He's being sarcastic, like, uh, Corey, how can I get rid of all the lizards around my pool and I? He, um, Dr. Lester, was asked to do a program in a, another county several years ago, pre-COVID. And um, the other county is kind of to our northeast and may or may not have 
you know, a development that takes over three counties <laughs> in our area. <laughs> and he went to speak to those. And that was one of the questions. Mm. And he had to really pull himself together to not walk out <laughs> on them. That's it's living in Florida. You know, we've got and some of them are non-native. You know, they've kind of made their way here to, but it is interesting that, um, you know, we have some Cuban lizards, some native lizards, and Bill has explained to me that they've kind of worked things out where our native ones stay up in the trees while the, um, the non-natives, you know, have taken over the ground level. So they've kind of, I have been seeing many different colorful geckos and anoles and lizards lately i i imagine they're probably not native um do you have much knowledge about them so i i don't much for this part of florida i haven't seen much other than the cuban anoles here i know that south florida has a large problem with the curly tailed lizards and the iguanas oh, and yeah. oh, um, yeah. <laughs> the, the agama lizards uh from africa and all kinds of things but i haven't seen much of that creep this far north yet, because a lot of those non-native lizards that aren't from here are from a tropical climate that they can't withstand freezes. And we are just at that level right. that we, we get those freezes. Well, they're stuff there in, in the villages. <laughs> you know, in, um, just the, the little lizards, they wanted to know how to get sure. rid of them. Probably just the little Cuban anoles, probably yeah. that love to be around there. Well, in my, I mean, and what harm are they doing? I mean, they're there, but they're- they, And they're, you know what? You know what I, the only critter probably at all that I hate? Roaches. <laughs> these lizards eat these roaches. <laughs> so therefore, sure. they, my friend, I just shared a Facebook post that said something about, you know, you're from Florida when you're on vacation and you miss your lanai lizards. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> So, uh, Buddy is in Tallahassee, so um, I don't think they have as big of, <laughs> they don't have iguanas up there quite yet, but it, that he'll need a no. shotgun. <laughs> but, Apparently they taste like chicken. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, and again, you know, you know, you could just hop on and host this. <laughs> <laughs> this is his answer to every uh, invasive plant or bug in his yard. Do not ever move next door to Bill Lester, I can tell <laughs> <laughs> PJ, she's from Marion County. So she says her friends have 15 acres near LaBelle, surrounded thickly by saw palmetto. They have bob white quails, rabbits, feral pigs, so many birds, which draw bigger birds. And yes, there is a bear or two going through, but not in the thick saw palmetto. So that is that sounds like heaven, you know, <laughs> to me. And then people want to go in and clear all that out, which I don't, yeah, <laughs> don't quite understand. Bill tells us the tegu lizards are coming. I know they are documented, vouchered in Hillsborough County. So they're probably on their way. They're driving up the parkway right now. <laughs> <laughs> They're in somebody's trailer. They're just gonna, yeah. Yeah, I do not look forward to the day when I walk out of my yard and see a three foot lizard. I can tell you that that's not, gonna, you know, gonna go over real well with me. And then I might be on board with Buddy. <laughs> but if you have any questions, um, you know, just put them in the comment. Um, uh, obviously, we have Dr. Lester kind of lurking <laughs> around here. He must be in between teaching in this uh, Master Gardener program. I'm actually rather impressed, you know, that he is multitasking. Um, so, <coughs> you know, being as he is, you know, male. So, <laughs> that he's able to do two things at once. We're very proud of him. All right. Now I'm acting like Bill, getting phone calls during the, the program. Uh, but he's stocking up, waiting for those lizards. What does a tegu lizard look like? Glenda would like to know. Can um, can you describe it? 
So Tygo lizards are, I'm trying to think what the maximum that they get, but they're several feet long. They're very thick bodied. They look like, um, like Komodo dragons to me, almost like small Komodo dragons, but they're speckled black and white. And um, that's, that's actually, if you can visual what a Komodo dragon, that's a great, they just have a thick head, really strong jaws and that they eat eggs. Um, and about how big are they? I'm trying to, I was just trying to Google what the maximum was, but they're usually when people see them, they're at least two or three feet long. Yeah. <laughs> they're at least as long as if you have one arm. Oh, wow. Yes. And Cindy says they've been spotted in Pinellas. Oh, mm. their bites hurt really bad. Oh, is this personal experience? No, but I know people have been bitten. Just like iguanas, it can, it can, it, you can, might, may have to have stitches if you get bitten by one. Cindy says they have a forked tongue. So we have a new listener who is now knowing me, I guess because of my comments about Bill being able to multitask and being male. This new listener is newly retired. So welcome. <laughs> welcome um, to to the virtual plant clinic, Mr. Aarons. He worked for, I don't know, 70 some years as the agriculture teacher at Hernando High School, 30 something years as the ag teacher at Hernando High School. So welcome, welcome for joining us, Rick. Um, and we were also talking about someone before the program started, Hannah and I, and Da -na -na -na. There she is. <laughs> Sid, Hannah is looking for you, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> but Sid tells us adult males are much larger than the females and can reach three feet in length at maturity. They may continue to grow to lengths of four to four to half. You know, how about just no? <laughs> four, four and a half feet. If I see one, it's just, just no. <laughs> The females are much smaller, but they may grow up to three feet in length from nose tall. So I would imagine you would have to worry about cats and small dogs like I have. Glenda's asking, what do they eat? So do we know this? Are we, do we know what they eat or are they omnivores? Uh, it is showing us a uh, good old Wikipedia, the black and white tag. You can look them up there. Okay. So, so they are omnivores and they do, they do consume fruit, eggs, insects, and small animals, including reptiles and rodents. Right. Yep. So it says omnivores too. Yes. So what is an omnivore? We're omnivores, meaning we'll eat whatever. <laughs> Is opportunistic. <laughs> yes, yes, to eat. So back to Sid. <laughs> um, yeah, you were looking for her for a reason. So let's kind of transition to that topic now. <laughs> you were wanting to find out more so you can present more to the public about uh, edible plants out in the wilderness. Sure. Uh, we have some some old presentations, some uh, reference material that was credited to Sid. And so um, I was just hoping to pick her brain about some of that. Uh, there's so much to learn. Um, oh. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. She's like, oh, I'll just give you a link. Um, here, I'll screen that. But um, uh, one topic that I hadn't explored yet is where we could ethically um, suggest that people can collect some of these items we talk about this is what you can eat this is what you can't eat but um but then the next step is where do you go if you want to mm -hmm. um collect ethically so it's, that's some of the topics we're exploring and then okay. if Sid doesn't want to talk about it right now i can reach out later right right to be uh covered in the future and you'll let us know when mm -hmm. you have classes i know sid is probably one of the experts out there on um Edible scan, edible scamping, <laughs> edible, yeah, edibles out in the woods um, that you, you know is safe to eat, that isn't safe to eat. Her, she and uh, Kristen Woods 
is, uh, you know, they both are good about that. And Kristen is now at the Dade, Dade Battlefield. Um, but I know that's becoming more and more of a, um, you know, a thing because people are looking for, you know, ways of saving money, ways of, you know, they just want to be more knowledgeable or if they happen to get lost in the woods or if, you know, total anarchy <laughs> happens to occur that, you know, what we can eat, what we can't eat. I know people eat dandelions, not that we have a lot of those, but it's something you want to be very, 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 very careful for. Just remember, um, None of, you know, none of us are, you know, that bad off that we have to eat these things yet. So don't go poisoning yourself. As Dr. Lester um, says, you know, he, the only mushrooms he eats are wrapped in plastic and, you know, in Publix or in Winn-Dixie or wherever. You really don't want to play around with mushrooms, especially with things that you don't know. She's just pointing out that you can do collecting, collecting on private property with permission kind of just like those um, palmetto berries too. And um, she says to message her right here on Facebook. <laughs> I will do. Okay. Yeah, beauty berry. You can eat beauty berries, Cindy, that is correct. If you have about 55 gallons of sugar, <laughs> right. can, yeah, um, it is edible. It's not, it's not necessarily all that good. You gotta add a lot of sugar uh to it the um yeah the native floridians that's why they would make uh jams and jellies and things of it but it doesn't have a high sugar sugar concentration which is why the birds if you've ever noticed they kind of wait until they are beauty berry raisins until they're black because they pretty would have a higher sugar concentration than their beauty berry is beautiful and it's all those nice purple berries but apparently doesn't have a, that high of, you know, they're not very sweet. So when that happens, we'll all be zombies, according <laughs> to Corey. Sid agrees with Bill on the mushrooms. So mm -hmm. as I'd say, we're not going to touch mushrooms in our, our teachings or offerings. It's a, yeah. that's Good a idea. whole subject yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. You don't need that kind of press. <laughs> no, Group no. found in circle. <laughs> Staring at the pine trees at the <laughs> conservation center. Yeah. Um, he likes the guy from Forrest Gump listing all the edible stuff <laughs> when he goes on walks with people. Yeah. Well, we got to find him, I guess. Um, Teresa is showing us, of course. See, Teresa acts as our producer. She's really the one who makes everything <laughs> run. She is, um, I, uh, she's a natural resource program assistant, um, overall mom at Extension. <laughs> so um, she, she's always in the background showing us where we can find more information. So the, the, of course, there's a publication for that. The University of Florida has a publication of eating um, of edible plants. So and I know so many people are very hesitant to bring that topic up. Well, what I get Yeah, go ahead. What I get excited about is um, helping to teaching people which plants they can eat, but then making the connection between well, a lot of those are available at native nurseries. And you can maybe they're not growing naturally in your area or your yard, but you can, you can put them there. Sure. Um, you can yeah. plant them there yourself. There's several that you can do that with. And so you can essentially native garden in such a way. I will start add a whole other layer. I have plenty of beauty berry and uh, prickly pear. And, and if it comes to starving, I might have to eat some of the palmetto berries. I'll leave some for the bears. <laughs> um, oh, I have bunnies too. If I get really hungry, I guess I have. Uh, well, I guess she doesn't like the beauty berries. Glenda doesn't. Um, Glenda wants to know, does anyone do a foraging class around here? That is what you're talking about putting together, right? Yeah. So we're, we're still a ways off from feeling like we have the expertise to do that. But I know that 
Kristen Wood at the Dave Battlefield uh, Historic State Park over there. She usually does them every two or three months. She has a big class where they, um, she actually comes and collects some things from Chinsika ahead of time with permission. Oh, so um, she knows exactly where it is too. Right, I know she does. Yes. Um, but there's a, she does like a three hour class where they, um, they learn about what's edible. They go out and do a brief collection walk. Um, they get to cook some of the things and, and prepare a lot of the things uh, that they learned about there, or she has some stuff pre-prepared that may have taken more time. But, um, but, but check the Dave Battlefield Historic State Park schedule for now. Every couple of months, the class comes up usually. And that's in Bushnell. Yes, right? that's in Bushnell. So it's yeah. a little bit of a drive maybe for some folks, Pretty but bad. as far as I know, yeah. it's a beautiful drive. As far mm -hmm. as I know, that's the only place around here doing offering something like that right now. Okay, and Sid has some more ideas. Scott Allen Davis at St. Mark's has thorough PowerPoint oh. on collecting. Oh, so you have to look that up, yeah. Of course. I'm you know, all... speaking of St. Mark's, I only recently just learned through a PowerPoint I put together that they have, in October, they have a bunch of monarchs that, you know, are taking off from there. What do you know about that? I, are you asking me? Yeah, yeah, if, if you know anything about St. Mark's and monarchs. I haven't heard anything about that before. I'm, I think that sounds amazing and I'd love to go visit. It yeah. sounds like that must be a jumping point on their um, yes. annual migration. Right, um, that it is. And that's why they say you go there in October, you should be able to see a bunch of them. So there may be a road trip in my very yeah. near future. Maybe how far, that'd be about a three and a half, four hour drive from yeah, there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I started to look into it. It wasn't, you know, as far into the panhandle as I thought, it's just kind of straight up there. So it, yeah, mm -hmm. might be, might, might be happening. <laughs> hey, an easy weekend trip, just a few hours. Yeah. yeah, except I don't have any weekends. I'm so sorry, the thing you wanted me to do that I have to do something else on that day. I'll let you talk about that before we go. Okay. But Robin sees mushrooms everywhere in my backyard, in her backyard. She doesn't know if they're safe to eat. How about just don't? That would be our <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> just say no. Just say no. It's not worth it. It really isn't, you know. And collect white acorns for flour. Mm. See, Sid, you just need to stop by, you know, and have a nice talk with Gina. <laughs> or, you know... You know, if you're not too busy there, you know, if you want to give a class, <laughs> you don't have to get to really retire. So let's see. The purslane is, is another weed that looks like you need to know how to identify correctly before we eat it. That's from the sim. Anything. That's good know? advice. Yeah, there's yeah. sometimes there's a lot of lookalikes uh, that are not always poisonous, but are noxious and you might not want to eat, but some of them are poisonous. So you gotta, you gotta be aware of the things that look like what you're looking for so that you can avoid them and only select appropriately. <laughs> Years ago, when I worked at County Extension, there was a gentleman who would come in um, who he was interested in um, collecting and eating stinging nettle, not just the root, he would do that, but even the leaves, the stinging leaves, he would make a tea out of it. I'm not suggesting you, you know, to do that, but that was just, and he was also interested in the rattlesnake weed, the Florida betony, which you can use like as a horseradish kind of thing as well. Teresa's telling us oh. about both state parks and Dade Battlefield. We can ride up there. Let's see what Sid says about mushrooms of the Gulf Coast states, a field guide to Texas, Louisiana, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. You know what? We just need to go to her house and see her library. That's <laughs> well, I know she utilizes the actual library as well, too. She she likes to tell me about books. Robin wants to know when does the growing season for vegetables officially start in the Tampa area and how should I get my soil ready? I think I can maybe answer this one. <laughs> I was saying, I know they were going to ask me um, vegetable questions. Um, so 
there is, which Teresa will be popping up any second now, a wonderful publication called the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide from the University of Florida that has charts that will help you, you know, know when to plant, what time of year. But basically about now is a good time to get started with your fall garden. Um, depending on, you know, what you're growing, you can just, Certainly, if you're trying with seeds, you want to start now. Um, but, you know, you can start with transplants. Between now and Labor Day, you know, is a good time to start your fall garden. And that's going to be another warm season vegetable. You're not garden. You're not going to think about uh, broccoli, cauliflower, <laughs> all those cool season vegetables till around mid-October to Halloween. Then you want to put those in. But right now, you're still going to be doing your tomatoes, you know, your green beans, um, and all those warm season vegetables. How should you get your soil ready? Um, Miss Teresa has put a link. You can actually go online to UF Soil Testing Lab and find this form. Um, she gave the link for, or you can walk into your county extension office and ask for it, ask for a soil testing kit. And they will give you the form, they'll give you some little bags, and you'll fill out on the form you want to test for your vegetable garden. And that will, you'll have, that's I think $10 per bag. And then you mail it up to the soil lab in Gainesville. They will send you a copy of the results. They will send your county extension office a, you know, a copy of your results, the exact same thing. So if you're here in Hernando, Bill will get a copy. On Thursdays, we have Master Gardener Bernie. He loves to go over those <laughs> soil tests with you. So, you know, if you're in Hernando and want to call on a Thursday and have him go over the soil test, you can um, certainly do that. Um, you know, it's kind of late right now. If in the summer would have been a good time when you're taking a break from the vegetable gardening to solarize the soil with some clear plastic. But, you know, you don't have to. A lot of people are doing raised beds or containerized. So, yes, now's the time to start. That's where you want to get your soil testing uh, done. And, you know, I would do it today so you can hurry up and get those results, you know, before it gets too late, to, you know, to put that garden in here is it's hard to see that the name is not with this i bet you that is the florida vegetable gardening guide that teresa is showing us but you can also google florida vegetable gardening guide uf anything you're looking for put uf after it so that you, oh casey wants to do this I know, she's <laughs> taking notes yeah. yes, so that you can um get because there's so much information out there on the web. So you can get research-based information from your land grant in your university who's not trying to sell you, you know, anything. Here's a publication also on lawn and garden, soil and fertilizer. She's also, there's a link to, <clears throat> there's a uh, program called Florida Friendly Landscaping in a Minute that the university puts on and they are talking about soil amendments as well. So Teresa's on a roll here. <laughs> showing I really enjoy that program. Yes, it is. It is very good. Yes. And I missed um, the book that Sid was talking about, she says, is new at the Citrus County Library. So I think I, am, I may have over answered <laughs> that question. But and I knew some vegetable uh, some vegetable gardening questions would come up. She says she's new to vegetable gardening and she's a little overwhelmed. Wish there were people who would come out and give advice. <laughs> I'm not, you know, there's not, there's not a lot, you know, people that will come directly to your house. But if you're here in Hernando County, uh, Robin, you know, go to the extension office, go right after this. Uh, Bernie is there till probably around four o'clock today. He's there every Thursday. He, that, you know, that's, that's 
what he's doing there, he's in the real life plant clinic. So, and he can sit down and give you all of his sage wisdom <laughs> on vegetable gardening. Oh, we lost Hannah for a second there. Oh no, what happened to Hannah, Casey? <laughs> it's okay, uh, we had somebody come in to the center. Okay, they live in Northwest Tampa, so Hillsboro County has a great county extension office in Sefner. You know, give them a call. Um, see what, and I believe they even might, they may have a demonstration garden. You know, it's a, it's a great, um, great program there in Sefner as well. Okay, I am being corrected that Bernie is there until four. <laughs> so Robin's not going there anyway, because she's um, over in Northwest um, Tampa. But if anyone else wants to see Bernie, he's there. Usually, I guess, nine to three on Thursdays. He, he um, I often, when I host, I have him um, host with me and he's a fan favorite, which is why I don't want to overdo him because I want to keep the excitement up <laughs> about Bernie. <laughs> he's very knowledgeable and uh, very um, not afraid to express his opinion. <laughs> so, and we have a very, very good time together and I'm going to have a class. Um, with Bernie, a regular class. I usually teach a online class every Wednesday morning. And uh, on September 21st, Bernie and I, or I will be leading Bernie in a class called Turf Talk with Bernie. So his 17 years of being a master gardener and uh, at the plant clinic every Thursday, except for, you know, about a year and a half in there, we know what was going on then, <laughs> the, 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 the lockdown, but he came right back and um, he's got lots of knowledge because generally people come to him with the same questions. So he has a whole lot of knowledge about turf and he loves talking about turf. He also loves though for you to bring him a question he's never heard before <laughs> so he can research and find and learn new things himself. Cindy's asking, if you plant now, how do you protect the new seedlings from the heavy rains during hurricane season? Well, <laughs> if anybody out there has any ideas for that, Corey or someone like that, if... Um, I found really that plants are usually really resilient and I mulch my beds really well and so that that helps with just soil stabilization mm -hmm. um so i do um just i do raised beds but um mm -hmm. but um i thought that i wouldn't be able to do a garden in hurricane season but i have yet to have a problem even yeah. with my vegetables that require um you know growing on, on some sort of apparatus uh it generally it's really um it's really hardy because uh, the wind can blow through whatever I'm putting up, whatever I'm stringing um, for things to climb on. It, it's not a large enough, uh, solid enough object to get blown over like your fence would or something like a solid right. fence. Would. Oh, yes. So, so and, it's, and, and Cindy, though, she's stuck down there in that peninsula on Pinellas, so it might get a little more oh. <laughs> with the, um, But yeah, if anyone else has any other ideas, yeah, for the soil stabilization would probably be the, one of the biggest things you would have to be concerned about. But I've never heard anyone say, oh, that tropical storm or that hurricane came and tore apart my vegetable garden. I mean, it, if it's bad enough, it's torn many things apart and your vegetable garden is the last of your worries. But <clears throat> yeah, I think they can, they need rain for sure. Yes, you can make jelly. Um, out of the beauty berries, uh, PJ, as I was saying before, um, they add a whole lot of sugar. <laughs> and they're right. Are, yeah, they are. Recipes. And you can eat them, but they yeah. are bitter. And most people don't want to. So right. they're not going to poison you. They just won't taste good. Right. So they, they'll make a good dye for your jelly <laughs> and a mm -hmm. substrate. But you've got to add other stuff in there to make it, you know, make you want to eat it. 
Um, Sid has another book, Adventures of a Transplanted Gardener, Advice for New Florida Gardeners. And this is by Ginny Steibold, and she is um, very popular out there. She has Facebook groups. She has all kinds of books. She is um, an expert in native gardens. So, and, you know, she takes you through her journey of when she bought just her regular Florida house and over the years of turning it into, you know, a native garden paradise. Um, I still, I believe she still has a little bit of lawn left, but it is what we call a freedom lawn and that, you know, it's weeds and green things and, and there's no chemical inputs, no extra water or anything, you know, going into it. Yeah, so Jenny's a good person to look up if you really want to know a lot about um, native gardening as well. Mm. <laughs> Sid Dow works for the Citrus County Library System. No, um, <laughs> she's right. She's she's spending a lot of time at the library there, and um, in Citrus County, and she points out you can get a dual card for both counties. And I didn't realize that. That's I great. And I think then you can also, you know, order things online or even get ebooks, things such as that. That is, that's really good information. So that's wonderful. And I know we were just talking about water conservation, and I had a question for you, Lily. Okay. Um, are you still doing your rain barrel classes? Yes, I am. At okay. Twice a yes. <laughs> I was just thinking as we were talking that um, we should you know, arrange another workshop up at your up at your place uh, in the fall. <laughs> right. Yes. I avoid outside stuff in the summer as much as I can. Um, yeah, um, October is getting kind of filled up right now, but maybe November or so. I'm hoping yeah. we have had a. Um, a lull uh, the compost bins have taken a sabbatical <laughs> they they um they are they are stuck they were stuck That's in um purgatory you know in supply chain purgatory i believe that soon we will have compost bins again and carmen and i will be able to have uh combined workshops so i'm thinking once the compost bins make a comeback maybe we can have you know a nice big combo um workshop at your place i think we're also planning one at the master gardener nursery but certainly yeah coming up in the future <laughs> that yeah. sounds good and that attracts people up to see your beautiful place i'm with you sid about we having heavy rain what i would like to order i'd like to put in an order for a three-day mild tropical depression <laughs> that gives us three days of nice good amount of rain without damaging anything because i think if, if we don't if hurricane season storm season doesn't ramp up we're going to be in a deficit come fall i'm not an expert on that that's just my um you know my thoughts from experience so hopefully we'll get some good several day tropical depressions at least to fill up our savings account of water in our aquifer. Um, Teresa uh, uses shade cloth, 30% uh, shade cloth when there's a big storm coming to protect her vegetables. So, oh, and Robin says public libraries sometimes have seed libraries um, as well. Hannah, what is your, your work email? I'm gonna put it in the comments because I'm not sure how to work the banners. Can I write it in the chat? Absolutely. How this works? Okay, I've never actually written in the chat. So. <laughs> like, how does this work? Oh, I can create a banner, okay. Say it out loud as you're writing it and I'll make it for both. Okay, so and I just sent it. So if you can't okay. see it yet, I can't. I can't look at banners and comments at the same time. So what is it? It is just my name, 
and it's Hannah, which is just four letters, H-A-N-A -A dot Brinkley, which is B-R-I-N-K-L-E-Y mm -hmm. at myfwc.com. Okay. Let's see. Sure. Woo! Look at that. I'm getting stream yard proficient here. Who needs Bill? No. <laughs> he's probably already gone because he's not answering. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. Um um, PJ, I'm not sure what question you were looking for uh, was what, what was what answered <laughs> while you were gone. We have about five minutes, so if you can post the question again, we'll see if we can get to that. Buddy, send it down. <laughs> You're getting rain in Tallahassee. Um, kind of jealous. Up, if you will, uh, yeah. let it roll down <laughs> to us a little bit. That would be. Uh, very helpful. Oh, I'm sorry. I overlooked your question about peaches from pits. Um, does anybody have any experience with that? If anybody out there does, I mean, I know kids do it for science experiments and I mean, it's worth a try. Um, probably what will happen if I'm going to take a guess is that um, peaches, like many, like all the other fruits out there, are grafted in some way, you know, to get the best attributes of that plant. So if you use the seed, just like you and I came from seed, <laughs> we did not look exactly like our brothers or sisters. So you're not going to get exactly what that peach was, you know, because that's, you know, the original, the original seed. So what you're going to get from it, um, I can't say, but it's certainly worth a try if you want to start with it and it starts sprouting and, you know, then you can, then Dr. Lester will be back and <laughs> can see, you know, what he has more to say about that. But, you know, it's always fun to start new things. Robin says thank you to all of us. Um, yes, thank you, ladies, for sharing your knowledge. Bissem thanks us. Sid has a bad here, a uh, bad connection. She, um, well, you're doing very well. You're connecting very well with us. She's only had 11.3 inches since June 1st in citrus in Dinellan. Yeah, that's it's we're we are behind. That's why I want. That's why I'm putting in that order for that tropical depression. <laughs> So, you know, rain without, you know, much damage. Yeah, Sebasem says peaches from seeds need to be grafted. So I don't know if you'll get anything really edible, but uh, PJ has tried to start the pits in water. And now she, but it didn't work, so she's trying it in the soil. No good so far. Come back with that question next week <laughs> for Dr. Lester. And we'll see what he has to say about it. Yes, yes, thank you all for the great group participation. See, we always start this out thinking, you know, how am I going to get through an hour? There's going to be these awkward silences. We're not going to know what to talk about. And then, boom, before we know it, an hour is up. So there's always a great group of people that participate. Um, and, you know, we have a good time together. And when we have special guests and get to learn more about what's going on in our county and elsewhere that just that just adds to it so what is next week this is the 18th um oh i will not be able to be here next week but bill will i have a meeting i need to attend next week so dr lester will be here will he bring special guests i don't know we'll have to find out um I'm working on our new mosquito control outreach person in Hernando County. Her name is Alyssa Haas, and um, she wasn't able to be here today, but uh, hopefully we'll be bringing her on at some point. And I will be back on the first, as will Dr. Lester. And then September 8th, 15th, and 22nd, I will not be here. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, 
I'll be back shortly thereafter. Yes, thank you, PJ. It is always fun. You're right. See, there are no poop questions or stories. We always end up talking about poop. If you watched my program I did yesterday with Dr. Lester on invasive species, invasive plants, he keeps bringing up poop. So it is Bill. <laughs> Bill is the guy who brings up <laughs> the poop questions. I mean, he had legitimate reasons. That's how invasive plants get spread. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just going to say it's Bill that brings up the poop. And with that, it is 11 o'clock. So um, like I said, I'm sorry I'm going to miss everyone next week. But I'll be back on the 1st. And Dr. Lester will be here on the 1st. And uh, he and I are having a class this coming Wednesday on natural products. Um, as pesticides in your yard. So that should be pretty interesting. So join us then. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Casey. And we will send up. Thank you, Teresa. Always thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Yes. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, uh, Rick Ahrens, for coming out and, you know, joining us in your retirement. And. <laughs> Yeah, we got some poop in here, too. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, and have a great week. We'll see you again.